All righty. Welcome, everyone. I'm Ken. I'm here with Linkso, and uh, we've got a Master Gardener class today. Uh, Janice Moody will be talking about not toxic gopher abatement um, in the garden or control, I should say. Uh, welcome, Janice. I'll turn it over to you, and I'll monitor the chat, and we'll um, talk towards the end of the presentation. Okay. Well, thanks very much for hosting this event today. To, to Link So and to Ken and to Terry, of course. Um, I, so let me just get started by telling you a little bit about myself. I have experience killing probably over 500, 600 gophers in my lifetime. Most of those were on my six acres in Pescadero. Um, I just decided that I was tired of seeing gopher mounds everywhere and I just needed to do something about it because I needed I wanted to sell my property. So one spring I got Thomas Whitman from Gophers Limited to come out and uh, he graciously came out, gave us a little PowerPoint presentation in the garage to my neighbors and myself. He went out and he set some traps before the before the meeting that we had and then afterwards we went out and and observed the traps and we got 50% kill within about an hour and a half. So it uh, it obviously works really well. And um, and so that's who I learned from. He's my mentor, that's Thomas Whitman with Gophers Limited. You'll see some videos of his throughout this presentation. Um, so let's, let's keep going here. Uh, it's not allowing me, oh, now it's a little slow and sorry. Let me tell you first who the Master Gardeners are. We are trained volunteers by the University of California to provide community service and educational outreach that helps home gardeners and community organizations garden sustainably and create a healthy environment. So the UC trains us and then we train the public in backyard gardening, basically. And it's a volunteer effort on our part, but we do need to keep up our continuing education hours each year in order to maintain uh, our status as a master gardener. I, I began my master gardenership in 2010. Um, this is how you can reach us. You can call our helpline at any time. And uh, this number appears here and you're going to be receiving a copy of these slides. So you'll have this information to reference uh, back to. We also have um, an, a, a reference slide at the end that gives you more information. You can also email us at uh, this the following email address and we'll get back to you in a few days. We used to have some open hours on site at Elkis Ranch, but I know that's down and out right now because of bridge washing out. So we have some other locations that are listed in the last slide that you can visit uh, certain days of the week and certain hours and bring in your gardening problems and discuss them with a master gardener. And you also can become a master gardener by filling out an application and about every year or every other year, we accept so many into the program. And then you were, you're trained for 13 to 15 weeks, one day a week, and you get to learn from UC professors many times. And then you get to give back to the community. I also wanted to put a little plug in for our spring garden market, um, which is happening Saturday, April 15th. Here we're going to sell tomatoes, sweet and hot peppers, eggplant, herbs, and succulents. That I also happen to um, be a donor of the succulents for this event because I have a nursery here in Hapoon Bay um, that sells primarily just succulents. And um, there are going to be educational stations and presentations, uh, and it's at the event center, the um, San Mateo Event Center on Saturday, April 15th, 9 to 1. So if you want your transplants so you can get started with your gardening early, then come on by, visit us. Okay, so I'm going to discuss today UC ANR IPM practices, which means University of California Agricultural Natural Resources integrated pest management practices. And so these are primarily focused on solving pest problems while minimizing risk to people and the environment. And it, we, we approach it from a non-toxic um, scenario. So we try to avoid poisons whenever possible. And the reason for that is that there's collateral killing of other animals via the food chain. You know, a heron eats a gopher that has been poisoned and that poisons the heron or the hawk or the coyote or the 
mountain lion or cat. So that's why we discourage the use of poisons. Um, there's also a risk of developing resistance to them and it pollutes groundwater and washes into our waterways and ocean. And there's also accidental poisoning of children or pets, of course. And then um, dead animals smell, especially if they if you poison a rat in your garage and it ends up in your wall, you don't you don't want that rat dying in your wall, believe me. I also teach the vertebrate pest abatement class for rats and squirrels and a deer and all the vertebrates. So first, let's discuss what's eating your garden. How are you going to tell what little critter is making those mounds in your garden? Because it's it's not just gophers that make mounds, as you well know, probably. We're going to talk about these two little critters because they're the ones that primarily uh, cause the damage in the gardens. But the gopher by far causes the most damage because they're eating vegetation and they're killing your plants. Whereas a mole just makes a mess and all it's eating is insects and grubs and worms and things. But it's hard for the average gardener to differentiate between whether they have mole damage or gopher damage. And so here I'm gonna educate you on that. So you're gonna become an expert and you can, you can decide which mound you wanna approach and which critter you wanna approach. So the primary differences is, is what I said, they, the gophers eat vegetation and roots and their mounds, I'm gonna show you pictures in next in the next slides, their mounds have open or plugged holes. So they make a little crescent mound and then they and then they are pushing the dirt out and making a little crescent mound around their hole. And then when they're done, they plug the hole and they are attracted to light. So if they see an open hole they didn't finish plugging, they're gonna come back to that open hole. And so keep that in mind because that's very handy to know when you're out hunting gophers that an open hole, if you see an open hole and it's actively being excavated, you know that little critter's coming back until he plugs that hole. So he'll be back any minute. Now moles, on the other hand, only, as I said, they only eat insects and worms, and they're attracted to moist living soil, especially if you compost or mulch that soil, which we all want to do as gardeners, of course. But when you do that, that brings in the light soil life, and that brings in insects and worms. And, and this is great for soil health, but um, that's what brings in the, the moles, unfortunately. Um, they're found under flagstones, edges of concrete, and under foundations because these places stay moister than other areas in your garden. And their mounds rarely have any visible holes and resemble volcanoes or raised tunnels, which I'll describe in the next uh, slides. They have a keen sense of smell. Can you see that nose of that mole right there? That's a long nose. And so they they very much have a keen sense of smell, whereas gophers have a tiny little nose and big teeth, and they do not smell as, as well as these uh, moles do. So keep that in mind too. There are, there are repellents that work for moles, but not necessarily for gophers because they're not, they don't smell it like the, a mole will. And also moles, you'll never see a mole sticking their little head out of the ground because they are repelled by light. They'll, they, they push up their, their soil from underneath, push it up and let it fall. And so they never actively stick their heads out of a hole. If you see a little critter coming out of a hole, it's, it's gonna be a gopher and not, not a mole. Again, just, just um, summarizing again, what gophers eat, vegetation, tree bark even, sometimes they'll nibble around the edge of that, but you know, usually they stay in the ground, although you will see them come out occasionally. So here's a difference between their mounds. Here's a typical gopher mound with a crescent shape and a plugged hole. Here's another mound, a couple active mounds actually. This is probably a nesting area with little guys and they're just pushing the soil out and have open holes here. And then here we have a typical mole mound, which just looks like a volcano and then a raised tunnel over here. And you see these in very, uh, you know, in foresty situations where, this, where the ground is very super soft, then you're gonna see more raised tunnels than you will in your garden area. Again, let's look at the, these um, mounds up close so you can differentiate them in the garden. 
Here's the crescent shape. It's they're not always crescent shaped. Sometimes they'll go all the way around, but normally it's crescent shaped. The gopher's coming from here, the bottom, and coming up into this whole area and pushing the soil around. So you know the tunnel is opposite the crescent in most cases. And here again is the nesting area that I showed in the smaller slide. And here, um, note the active hole over here with fresh soil around it. That gopher is coming back any minute. But note these drier mounds over here that uh, have been here longer period of time. So if you're going to set a, a trap, you want to do it in an active mound versus an inactive mound. And by the way, um, I discussed trapping, and it's it's not um, it's not where you trap and release. So no one wants gophers. It's illegal to set them loose anywhere, even in park parks. You can't do that. It's illegal to do that. So I'm sorry to say, the trapping I discuss is lethal. And if you don't like the look of dead gophers, then you don't want to watch that portion. Okay. Here's typical mole mounds. They go along the edge of sidewalks a lot of times because that's where the moisture is under, underneath the sidewalk. And here's a forest situation where it's a raised tunnel. And then again, these raised volcanic mounds dotting the landscape up, up and down here. And this is one mole doing all this damage. So, now we're going to talk primarily about gophers and how to abate them in your garden. Um, yeah, uh, some people think they're cute. I don't necessarily think so after the damage they did in my, in my son, my six acres, but some people call them cute. Here's a sample field in, in my, that was my six acres. And this is before trapping. And this, this is at the end of uh, the fall season, very little very little moisture content, so very dry, but there are all these open mounds and holes everywhere dotting the landscape. And then a year later, this is what I had. I actually had some, some grass growing back. It was wonderful to see. So don't, don't be discouraged. You know, you, can, you too can do this. I, I caught 400 gophers in three and a half months. And, the, and Thomas Whitman, who came in to give us the, the education on this. He said, oh, you probably only have about 25 gophers here. But he didn't realize that I was right next to a creek and open space. And so as soon as I killed some of these gophers here and then I irrigated in the summer and there was very little um, you know, vegetation left in the, in the end of the summer and fall, well, this is where they come. They come to the irrigated spaces. So you have to keep that in mind. There, there's a constant flux of these little guys coming in if you live near open space like I did. So what does gopher damage look like? Well, they eat the roots typically, and they will actually pull, pull a poppy straight down into the ground. You've probably seen that happen where a plant was there one minute and the next minute it's gone. They just can pull it straight down and eat the whole thing. Um, this is a squash that was growing on top of the ground, of course, and then that gopher came up and started nibbling on the bottom of the squash, and I, didn't, I couldn't figure out what was wrong with the squash until I moved it and saw the hole underneath it. Darn it. And here is a New Zealand flax, Formium. This is a, gr a grassy type of uh, a plant, and they just love grasses. Gophers just love grasses. So when I give gardening advice to people, you know, consultations, and they ask me about gopher cages, I say, well, the only thing I probably would spend money on would be formiums because they're an expensive plant and you don't want to really lose them to gophers. So I do cage these um, formiums, um, or I do recommend that people do. And there's probably, there's not much else that I would recommend that you cage, but the, these I do. And I'll show you why in the next slide or the next couple next slides. Um, let me talk a little bit about the gopher life cycle and breeding habits. They're, they have a three to five year lifespan. They don't hibernate and they're active at any time of the year. Although I think they're more active in the spring when, when with the rains, when the rain, rain start and everything greens up, I see a lot more activity. And that's when they tend to have their litters in the, in the spring. Uh, they can have two to 10 per litter. Um, they can have three to five litters per year. 
on irrigated land and one to two litters on non-irrigated land. And then um, the female is pregnant for only 18 days and the young are weaned in five to eight weeks. And then the dispersal begins, the mother drives them off and this dispersal is above ground. So if you ever go out at night and you see little gophers uh, running around on the ground, that's probably because their mother just dispersed them to let them go on their own. And they, they usually go anywhere from three to 400 feet from their old burrow. They are daytime and nocturnal grazers, but I see less of them in the middle of the day. And I think it's because they're more visible to predators like you know the blue herons and the hawks and the cats and everything. So I tend to see more activity in the early morning and, and evening time. Uh, their biology and behavior, they're ter territorial by nature, but will share burrows during mating season. And if one dies, another one will move in pretty rapidly. Um, so some are some burrows are common and shared by many gophers. So reoccupancy of the of the burrows is rapid, as I just said. Uh, there can be 100, 1 to 200 gophers per acre, but usually the range is 24 to 36. Here's a typical gopher mound, what you, what you would see underground if you could see underground. Their burrow system is right here where they travel and, and come up to eat. And this is about five to eight inches deep in a normal you know, home garden or background, uh, backyard. And, un, and further below that is food storage area and a nesting area. And then this is where they come up and they might have feeder holes or they may be just burrowing through and excavating and pushing out their soil. And this is what that looks like as you saw before. They just push up the soil and then they plug the hole when they're done. Uh, keep in mind this five to eight inches is for a home gardener. In a commercial application where you have tractors and a lot of tillage going on, um, those gopher burrows can be deeper, much deeper because of the tillage that goes on on top. So here's a little thing I thought you would enjoy seeing about uh, what I encountered one day. Uh, let me see if I can get it. Here we go. What is out of the ground and nibbling on the grass? Oh my goodness. Not a good thing to do around me. <laughs> so I was installing this this garden and this little gopher appeared, but you know, it didn't live very long. Just <laughs> sorry to say. Um, and that was probably a dispersal situation where mother dispersed it and it was trying to find a new home. Um, so non-toxic gopher management. We're going to talk next about lethal trapping. And that's a preferred method. And the gun gopher barriers and gopher resistant and favorite plants, natural predators, feral cats are the most effective. Uh, we're going to talk about some non-tested solutions that you might hear about that haven't been uh, um, actually tested by any research and some radical methods. Okay, so here's the traps that I'm going to discuss. Primarily, the one I'm going to focus on the most is called the cinch trap right here on the left. And that's the one I use. And that's the one I was trained to use by Thomas Whitman with Gophers Limited. There's also the black box, which can be very effective. Um, Maccabee has been around a long time and is very effective. Um, they just have their certain disadvantages, which I'm going to discuss. There's also the one recommended by University of California Cooperative Extension. They did research of their own. They found the gophenator to be the most effective, but they do their research on commercial fields. And as I mentioned, those burrows are much deeper on commercial fields. So they didn't find the cinch trap to work very well for them because it, it, has, it only goes in the ground about six inches or eight inches at the most. And so they couldn't get to the actual burrow and set this trap with this, this kind of a trapping system. So this is the one they recommend, the gophenator. It's stainless steel, it doesn't rust, and it is a very good trap. If you, can, if you have the dexterity to use it, then by all means use it, and if you, don't mind digging holes, then by all means use that one. I prefer the cinch trap though. 
There's also one that's touted by many people on next door. It's called the Gopher Hawk, and I do believe it is effective. Um, I just haven't had good luck with it, maybe because the first time I used it, I accidentally bent the snare at the end. And once you bend this snare, it uh, doesn't open up very well in the tunnel system. And then the gopher has trouble traveling through it. So uh, I've, I've tried it for moles because I thought it would be more effective for moles, but so far I haven't caught anything in it. I just go back to my old reliable cinch trap because I'm used to it. But many people say that this, this works well for them and I'm gonna show you a demonstration on this. Okay, and there's no digging involved, which is very advantageous. Here's the gopher hawk demonstration. Gophers and moles can be a big problem. Trapping the pest cleanly and organically should be fast, simple, and effective. Introducing Gopher Hawk, a new approach in gopher trapping and removal. Effective and easy to use for everyone from beginners to professionals. Gopher Hawk can be placed in the ground vertically without the use of a shovel. As with any trapping system, start by probing the affected area to find the active gopher run. Use the wedge to open the probe's hole. The wedge compresses the soil outward instead of digging it up, meaning no shovel and no mess. Once in place, pull upward on the outer sleeve to set the trigger. The trap is now primed and ready to catch the gopher. You always know when the trap has been triggered. The catch indicator sits above ground and can be spotted from a distance. As the trap is set, the trigger and snare is deployed into the tunnel, catching the pest as it passes through. Okay, so um, let me just pause that thing. Gophers and moles um, can be a big problem. Okay, um, I just wanted to say the reason I bent those snares is because I didn't follow the instructions and you have to pull up on it. You never push down on it when you're installing those. So just that's the trick. Follow the instructions and you won't bend your snare like I did. Here's traditional trapping with two traps. Um, these might these are Maccabees in here. You dig a hole, you put you want put a trap going this direction and this direction because you don't really know which way the gopher is going to travel. And you do the same for black box traps here. Two, two traps normally if you want to make sure you get you get the gopher. And these are very effective. It just requires more digging. And then you have to tie the traps. Uh, the, the black box isn't less likely to be you know taken off and, and moved somewhere by a predator. But these little Maccabees, you know, they they can get lost if um, you you trap you trap a gopher in it and then a predator comes by, a scavenger or say, let's say, and they take it with them and they take the trap too. So you have to tie them down. Um, now here's the gophinator trap that you see recommends, and I want to show you how that works. If you have a gopher problem in your garden or landscape and have been unsuccessful using other traps or control methods, you may want to try the gophinator. This trap has been tested by University of California researchers and was found to be more effective than other traps. The gophinator can allow you to trap large gophers and increases the success of catching gophers and reducing their damage. The gophinator trap is made up of many moving parts, the jaws, the trip bar with nub, the treadle pan with U-shaped hook, and the winder. It's important to wear gloves while handling the trap. Once set, the gophinator is very tightly wound and may cause significant injury. Watch as Neve Quinn, UC Vertebrate Pest Advisor, demonstrates how to set this trap correctly. To set the trap, unwind the winder, then lift up the treadle pan Move the trip bar into position by securing the left jaw under the nub of the trip bar. Open the jaws and make sure the trigger pin is hooked onto the jaws. Secure the pin underneath the treadle pan's U-shaped hook. Fold the treadle pan down towards the front of the trap. Hold the trap in your left hand with your four fingers on top of the treadle and rotate the trap 90 degrees away from you. With your right thumb on the winder, Twist your hands towards each other in a towel wringing motion until the winder fits into the loop. 
Carefully remove your left hand as the trap is now set and could easily snap. Pull the treadle back towards the winder so the trap can be activated. The trap is now ready for placement. To trigger or reset the gofenator, toss it onto a hard surface away from people or pets. See UCIPM's YouTube channel for videos on how to find an active gopher run and how to correctly place gopher traps. For more information about managing gophers and other pests, see the UCIPM website. Okay, so that UCIPM website is also helpful for any kind of pest. You can go there and you can get advice on any type of pest in the garden. So all you need to do is Google UC and IPM and all, all of this will come up and be visible to you. So um, now I'm going to talk about the cinch trap, which I prefer to use, and its advantages. You only need one trap because half of it stays above ground, and you're pointing it in the direction that the gopher will be traveling. So you don't need to go two different directions. You know which direction the gopher is going to be coming up from. Um, there's less digging involved because of that. And half the trap is above ground and visible, so you know when it's tripped. When you see the trigger halfway up, then you know that you've got, you probably have a gopher in the trap. And we'll go and describe that. This is how you set it in the hole. Once it's set up here, which we'll go into, then you slide it into the lateral tunnel, into the main burrow, make sure it's open. And you know, you're using a digging tool to dig out any dirt that might be in there and make sure you feel air space down here. And then, you're good to go because that gopher is going to be coming along that burrow again, bringing dirt up to excavate his burrow. And when he comes up this way, his little head gets in between these two cinches and that's what, and then this is the trigger he triggers. So it's a very humane kill. Don't worry about them suffering too much. Most of the time it's very humane. This is the this is an incorrect way to place a trap. This is a feeding hole where the, the gopher might be coming up and nibbling on some grass around the hole and um, he cannot trigger this thing because he's just going to walk right through it this way and he's not going to go up into it and, and hit the trigger. So do not ever put a trap in straight uh, vertically. Make sure it's at a horizontal, a slightly horizontal angle like this to be effective. So as I said, fresh is best. You want to rake or flatten out the mounds the day before you intend to trap. Look for the freshest mounds. They're usually wet in the spring or they're solitary. They weren't there yesterday. Uh, remember that gophers will eventually return to plug the open excavation holes and daylight will attract them. So you don't need any bait. That's a good thing. So all you need is daylight is the base. It is the bait. Um, moles avoid daylight and will not usually leave an open hole. So uh, you will not trap a mole by, by leaving that hole open. These are the digging tools. And what uh, Thomas Whitman uses is a hori hori, and that's what I use. And the longer the handle, the better. 12 to 13 inches is ideal if you can find a long one. Um, this one is a great tool that I had, but it broke on me. It's a narrow transplanter, and I've been able, unable to find one since I broke that one. But that's a great digging tool as well. The trigger settings for a mole are um, this least sensitive is where the trigger up here, the pin is all the way at the top of the trap and the loop is way down here. So that's the least sensitive setting if you were going to try to trap a mole. And you don't necessarily need to trap moles. You could just, um, just ignore them. You don't need to necessarily do anything about them unless they're making a really awful mess in your yard and you want to get rid of them. Um, then the gopher trigger setting, you leave the setting on the most sensitive setting where the pin is at the very tip top and the loop is at the very tip. The, the loop tip is just balancing on the pin right there. When you buy these, um, this is real important. Um, you want either the medium mole, and it's a cinch brand trap, not a cinch type trap, but make sure it says cinch on it. It's a brand. Um, you want medium mole or a small gopher, and it, the diameter is two and a quarter inches because there are really big gophers in the plains area, 
and they can go up to three, three and a half inches wide for gopher traps. And you don't want, we don't have big gophers out here. So you want to get a medium mole trap or a small gopher trap, and the diameter is two and a quarter inches. And you can get these uh, Home Depot online. I think get two traps per box. That's probably the cheapest way to do it. Or you can go to Amazon and get them as well. So here's the biggest here's the biggest gopher I've ever trapped, and uh, I've got it mounted on my wall right up here. No, actually I don't, but people always laugh at that, so I thought I'd inject a little comedy. Um, and then here's a medium mole and in a cinch trap. Uh, here's the two sizes I use. Normally I use the two and a quarter inch cinch trap for average gophers. And this is a three inch large cinch trap if you've got a fat gopher in. Uh, around the corner from me here in Half Moon Bay, we happen to have this variety of gopher right here, which is a wider, has a wider head than a typical gopher. So this one is the, the wider, the bigger trap is useful for these kind of gophers if you have wide fat gophers. I, I would set a trap over here for my neighbor and I kept telling him, oh, I'm going to get this gopher in any day now. And it kept tripping and tripping and tripping. And then I finally put in a larger trap and got him within 10 minutes. So trap size can make a difference. Here's a demonstration of how to set this trap. All right, so here is our cinch trap. Uh, it's designed to be able to remove your gophers and moles. Uh, just a quick overview of the trap. We have our A loop wire, our B loop wire, our C trigger wire, and our D uh, active jaw wire. Uh, so easily enough, I can show you how to set the cinch trap. I would definitely place it into your hand uh, bringing the D wire or active wire over across the trap. With that, then you bring the A wire or loop wire over the top of that active wire. Then you'll bring the D wire over the top of your A wire, and then easily enough sliding your C wire or trigger wire into position. Uh, I would recommend definitely using your thumb on the back end of that loop wire that is so that when you decide to put the trap into the tunnel system, that the trap does not go off in your hand while you're easily sliding it in there. The other part is to, to avoid any binding on your loop wires when they're being set, is just to make sure to push it with your thumb so that the loop wires are at its most pivotal point. Uh, and then that is what you would uh, do to set your cinch trap. And now it is ready to be placed in the into the tunnel and removing your gopher or mole. Okay, so um, that one I think is a lot is a lot simpler to set versus the gophinator. You remember how many steps there were to the gophinator, and it requires a lot of strength in your thumbs to set the gophinator. And every time I try, I have tried setting it, I have to watch the YouTube on how to set it. But I'm sure I could get the hang of it after a while. But this is why I prefer the cinch trap versus the gophinator. Um, here's how I set it. Now he said it, he has a lot of strength in his hands, obviously to do that, I don't. So this is how I set the cinch trap. I'd like to show you how to set a cinch gopher or mole trap. First you dangle the pins downward so they're not tangled at all. Then I like to use a hard surface like a tabletop so it's easier for me to move the trigger over. Some people can do it on their knee and I don't have the strength to do that. So I prefer to put it on a table with the uh, pincers overhanging the table because if I put it on the table like this, it, it doesn't properly work. So you have to hang those pincers down over the edge of the table. Now I take, because I'm right-handed, I take my right thumb and I pull the trigger over and this is, uses a lot of force. A lot of strength, I should say. And if I didn't have that strength in my thumb, you should use your palm. Then you take this first pin, cross it over, and hold it down with your th opposite thumb. And you take the last pin, cross it over again, and you hold it down with your left thumb or opposite thumb. Now it's easily held in place. But 
I have to remind you that this trigger is very powerful, especially when they're new. So be cautious of your fingers and where you put them. I'll show you in a minute why. When you were set this trap for gophers, we want to put it on the most sensitive setting, which is way back here. The pin is way back here, as well as the loop that keeps the pin held back. Now, if I'm setting this trap for moles, I want to put it on the most sensitive setting, which the, so the loop would be way down here and the, and the pin would be back here. Now let's say a gopher comes along. You've got this in the hole waiting for the gopher to come by, come along. This is what happens. I'm going to hold it very carefully right here so that this trigger doesn't hit me when, it's, when this goes off. The gopher comes up from the tunnel and up through the hole and this is what happens to the gopher. And that could easily, this, when you let go of this, when this is released, let me show you what happens to that trigger now. It completely goes all the way over. So if you find a cinch trap with the trigger in a partially deflected manner, then you probably have a catch down here. If you find the trigger all the way over like this, it's a probable miss. So that's it. Okay. Um, so yeah, just, uh, I probably shouldn't have even put my fingers near that, where that trigger goes over. So just be cautious about that. It was probably careless on my part to even show you with my putting my fingers on that other side. So when you set this trap, be sure you keep your fingers away from where that potential trigger can come over and hit you. It's really will sting quite a bit. You only do it once, by the way, and then you never do it again. <laughs> um, I'm not going to, well, this trapping demonstration, um, I'm going to hold off probably because I think that the one that Thomas Whitman does is better than mine. So I'm going to skip this one, but you can always go back to it from the, when you get the slides and you can watch my, my trapping demonstration out in my field. This is the one done by Thomas Whitman. Cinch surface trapping demonstration. And we're out here in a field. Here's a gopher mound right here. You can see the crescent shape of the mound. And then here's the actual plug where the gopher's burrow is, indicating the tunnel's going this direction. So I'm gonna take my Hori Hori, Japanese knife. I'm just gonna place it right here and sink right into the burrow entrance. I'm gonna pop this out. Cleaning out the dirt until the clear into the burrow. Set my cinch trap. Carefully placing it in here. A little bit more room. Make it sensitive and set a flag out and we're ready to go to the next. Here we are at the cinch set demonstration in the field. Um, about one hour later, and we have a sprung trap here, so we're gonna pull it out and see what's going on. And we got ourselves a beautiful gopher here. You can see when the gopher's caught in a cinch trap, it's a humane kill right around the neck. And so to get a gopher out of a cinch trap, all you need to do is pull back on the spring. It drops out. And then we're just gonna take him, examine him a little for just a minute. We just put him right back in the hole again like this. becomes fertilizer for the plants and trees and shrubs around here. And this whole problem now is solved. Let's see what else we got. And we're at the cinch demonstration, a second hole here, and it looks like we got another one. And there we go, another gopher. This one a pretty small one. So we're just gonna take them right off like that. Very easy. We're just gonna put them right back in the hole and cover it up. That's a pretty small animal, but if you look around here, and here's a burrow we just dug, 
That little animal did all this damage. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's that's how you set them. And um, it is pretty easy, if you, especially if you have an open hole, you can get that gopher within a matter of seconds because they're going to be back any minute. And I've had virtually, uh, literally, put one in a hole, turned around, and walked away, and it went off. So it can happen that fast. There's other helpful videos from Thomas Whitman, and there's the link to them. You can do that at your leisure. And um, I'm glad he demonstrated that you put the gopher back in the hole, because that's the first question I get when I do these presentations in person is, what do you do with all those gophers? Well, you know, we're, we're all meant to be compost, you know, even us. <laughs> so I tell my kids, you know, I just want to die in my garden. All you need to do is dig a hole and bury me and I'll make the best compost ever. So just keep burying those gophers. The only problem that might come about is if you've got scavengers in the area and they see you do it, then they could possibly dig it up. And I've, I had that happen one night here in my place and it, the gopher ended up at the other end of the, of the lot and some scavenger got it. So uh, just make, make sure you, you put them in all the way to the burrow depth, eight inches or so, and then they won't smell them and dig them up. All right. When your traps experience misses or, you know, they get rusty parts, then you need to do some maintenance. Try to keep them out of the rain, store them in a dry area because they do rust. Whereas the gophanator is stainless steel and it doesn't rust. So that's an advantage of the gophanator trap. Um, and the oil, I put oil on, the, oil on the moving parts. Now, moles may detect that odor, but gophers won't. They're, they're pretty dumb and they won't smell that. And I use medium steel wool to remove the rust from the triggers and pin loops. And I replace the pins with galvanized, or you can replace the pins with galvanized wires that don't rust. That's what Thomas Whitman does. I do have a video on this maintenance. Let me see, check the time. I think we're okay. Let me show you the video on maintaining it. Now I'd like to show you how to keep your cinch trap in good operating order. First of all, try not to leave them out in wet weather because they do rust and eventually uh, the parts freeze and there's lots of parts that you need to clean in order to keep them movable. The two areas that I oil are predominantly this right here, it's had to hinge, and this spring. So these two I do place some WD on or some, or some uh, 30 weight oil. And then this trigger I also clean with steel wool. So this is gonna get a lot of rust on it and I usually clean it back and forth this way and I do the same all the way down and then I push it all the way down and I clean it some more. Both sides, make sure you get on both sides so you're gonna to have to flip that pin around to get it to the opposite side. I move it back and forth a few times just to make sure that I get all the rust removed all the way up and down this, this trigger here. And the pins also tend to get rusty on the loops, ends, and the entire pin itself. And if they get rusty, they catch on these other areas. So you're gonna have to clean each trigger, or each pin with st medium steel wool like this, and then make sure you get the loops by scrubbing them off on both sides very thoroughly. And don't forget this last one on the end here because this holds back the pin. So you wanna make sure you get this area as well, very clean. And then I might take a little cloth dipped in some oil and just rub these areas. And that helps prevent some rust from occurring again. It also keeps them slippery, which you want these, these to be slippery. So that's it. Okay. Um, here's some other, um, here's the link to that video right here, as well as um, Thomas Whitman's link as to how to maintain those traps. So let's talk about wire barriers, uh, do's and don'ts. So I've encountered a lot of um, gopher wire in my day, and 
I can tell you now that the best what the best ones to use are either three quarter inch gopher cages like this, and I, as I said, I probably only use them on formiums. Uh, they also have three quarter inch galvanized stainless steel gopher wire, galvanized or stainless steel gopher wire, which comes in rolls, and I think Linkso does does sell these rolls of um, galvanized gopher wire. They might even have stainless steel. I'm not sure. Um, there's also a half inch hardware cloth, which is really a wire. It says it's, it's labeled cloth, but it's actually half inch galvanized hardware wire. And then these two wires here are very flimsy in nature. You all are familiar with chicken wire and it's one inch wide. Well, it's too, it's too big for, for the first, the first thing about it is that it's too big for a, a gopher. A gopher can get through that, squeeze right through that, a small gopher. And it's very flexible and it, and it rusts out in two to three years. So it's not going to provide adequate protection for any length of time. So never use chicken wire. I do occasionally use aviary wire, which is also flexible. And the advantage to using that is that you can use it for, as a temporary cage for maybe a tree if you want to protect a young tree, but you want it to rust out in a couple of years and allow those roots to, to get deeper because you do not want those tree roots girdling in a cage. And that's why I tell people never, never, never put your tree in a gopher cage because I've seen it happen far too often where the tree roots will girdle in the cage and kill the tree or make it very unhealthy. Um, here's other gopher barriers. Here's that gopher cage again. And here's stainless steel um, cages, which lasts a lifetime. You don't ever have to worry about them uh, rusting out. These uh, galvanized ones will last 15, maybe 20 years, depending on how wet the soil is. Um, then there's this one, this stainless steel one that's gaining popularity, but I don't recommend it. It has very tiny holes. It might be fine for annuals and perennials if you really need to protect your annuals and perennials that have very thin roots that won't girdle, um, but they're not good for shrubs at all. I mean, shrubs, woody shrubs have woody roots. Woody trees have woody roots. So those I I'm less likely to put in cages because of the fact that you could see them girdling, especially trees. And this this um, this one also folds down quite a bit, and so it doesn't stay above ground. And ideally, you want part of that cage above ground because gophers can jump over and get into your into your plant area, your root area. They do travel above ground at times, as you saw in that video, for instance. And here's where I used um, my own aviary half inch aviary wire to make a big three foot cage for an orchard tree. This is because I couldn't monitor the growth of these trees. I wasn't on site to do that. So I, this is how I got these trees established by making my own temporary cage with aviary wire, which is half inch and rests out in two, two or three years. Um, here's an example of what can happen when you make your own cage out of a uh, half inch hardware cloth. Now let me show you what a neighbor of, of mine did. Here's an example of what happens when you place a tree in a small gopher basket that won't rust out for 15 years. It's obviously root bound and therefore a sickly tree as evidenced by the scale up here. Yeah, so that's my neighbor's tree. And um, luckily, there some roots escaped that, that gopher cage and it became established, whereas the one next to it right down the street actually blew over in a storm. So um, <laughs> so don't go for, don't cage your trees if you can help it. Uh, this, this is what happens. These I found in my field. Someone dumped them in my field one day. And these are, this is a gopher cage around girdled roots and a dead tree. And here's another one that has a gopher, that had a gopher cage around to see how the roots are all girdled. And that's what killed those trees. Here's my basket that I made in the prior slide. I guess I'm duplicating the slide here, but this is the three by three um, basket I made out of aviary wire to protect my orchard tree for a couple of years. 
Here's where I used aviary wire on top of the surface. You can use any kind of wire. It doesn't have to be aviary wire, but that's easier to, to work with. And I just put it underneath my squash plant so, so that this did, would not happen again, where the gopher came up and ate my squash. So if you put wire on top, then you're protecting your squashes from being eaten from underneath. Here's how you go for proof of planter box. Um, do it on the outside edges, preferably, because if you put that wire on the inside edges, you're going to have gaps in there, and those are those potential gaps a small gopher could squeeze through. So I always recommend putting the gopher wire around the outside edges, stapling it thoroughly, or just putting the gopher wire all the way across the garden area, including the pathways, and that that's nice because then they won't try to... Um, mound up and try to get to the inside by mounding around the edges and eventually burying your planter box, which I've had happen in my field. Uh, they just mounded up so much dirt around the outside edges that they eventually could just get over the top. So um, putting it all the way across and then mulching your pathways, putting mulch down on top of the wire is, is great. Mulch is all so healthy for the soil. Um, as we all, ma we master gardeners talk about soil a lot, and I do that in my presentations as well when I talk about succulent gardens, and I'm doing a presentation for Linkso, I think it's next month, and you can check with Linkso on what Linkso site, but um, I talk about succulent gardening and the importance of soil. So that's a plug for my next presentation. Uh, let's see. So it, some people like vineyards for instance they they don't want they, there's no way you can put gopher wire and protect all of your vines with each individual vine so what i have seen done is they have a deer fence to keep the deer out obviously and then they'll put a, a vertical fence underground wire fence along the edge they'll have it like six inches above the soil level and they'll put this wire straight down and you and then you'll bend it away from the area you want to protect. So this is outside and this is inside. So you put the gopher wire down and bend it away and preferably have that be the cut edge down there because if they get nicked when they touch that cut edge, they, they, they're kind of like homophiliacs in a sense and they can bleed out. So I know it's not a pleasant death, but that's another way of you know abating them. So the, so the gopher comes along, hits this and goes down and then gets diverted away. That's, and they usually don't go down more than, you know, 18 inches. So you want to put that wire down at least 18 inches. And under lawns, of course, no one is planting a lawn these days, but just in case you are planting a ground cover or other alternative and you want to protect it from gophers, um, you need one to two inches of soil on top of it. So you're going to either have to raise up the level of the soil or scrape off a lot of soil and then replace it on top of the gopher wire. Uh, just so you know that you, you don't want to put the roots right on top of the gopher wire because then they can eat all the roots and there was there'd be nothing for the roots to live in. So do do keep that in mind when you're when you're trying to to protect uh, ground covers. This, you could also do this for other planting areas, but you would have to go down so deep, it's really not worth all the digging, in my opinion. Other ways to protect from gopher damage is to put hardscape or rock areas, a barrier of, you know, if several feet or maybe, a, you know, driveway width. You know, a lot of times gophers won't travel under barren areas if there's no roots. If they detect that there's vegetation nearby, that's the you know that's the direction they're going to go. But so if they they're less likely to travel under streets and under driveways and under pavement areas or rocky areas because there's nothing there for them to eat. Here at the Pescadero Post Office, we just we as we built this new brick planter over here, and I had them put mortar in the bottom, and then I drilled half inch holes periodically down so that it would drain. And but no gophers could get in that area or moles for that matter. I probably see more mole damage here than gophers, but just in case, that's one way of, um, of protecting your masonry areas. And a, a lot of people think that well, I'm just going to plant my plant in a plastic pot and that will protect it from the gophers, but 
No, that's not actually true because I have seen them eat through big 15 gallon pots. I, I once planted a bamboo in a big 15 gallon pot thinking this would confine it because they tend to spread really easily. Well, the gophers started gnawing at the little holes in the bottom and pretty soon there were big holes in the bottom of this pot. So they can gnaw through this black plastic pretty easily, including, including the irrigation lines. If they're thirsty enough and they detect water dripping out of these, then they'll go after irrigation lines. So ideally you don't want water left in your irrigation lines when it turns off. You want the water to disperse completely so they don't detect the moisture and go after your irrigation lines. This is a garden I encountered where they thought they were smart and they planted all their plants in pots. And so here's here's all the empty pots. This does not this does not let your roots go very far, and they 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 don't uh, they don't get established as a drought tolerant plant if you if you keep them in pots. And uh, obviously, half the plants died. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about gopher resistant plants. There are some. The safest bets are daffodils and naked ladies from the amaryllis species. Um, they, uh, they seem to not go after them and, and I deer don't eat them either. So if you wanna plant something that deer and gophers don't get, daffodils are a good bet. Um, there's, I'm not gonna read all of these, but I'll let you go through them yourself. And this is Thomas Whitman's experience and Pam Pierce, that's, this is her recommendations from her experiences. And uh, by the way, most succulents are fairly gopher resistant. And even if they're eaten, they can oftentimes reroot and recover. Um, the roots of most succulent plants are hardly visible. And so a gopher is not really going to be attracted to them. Uh, yeah, but other, there are other types of plants that have really ropey roots that they're going to go after more so. I'll show you some examples here. For instance, here's a typical succulent root. This is a root bound plant, by the way, that really needs a bigger pot, but you can barely see the roots here. They're so fine in nature. So if a go <clears throat> excuse me, if a gopher is going to go after something in the garden, what do you think they're going to eat? Do you think they're going to eat these formium roots or perhaps agave roots? And this is the exception to the succulent roots. There are some succulents like agaves and aloes with really ropey roots. Haworthias have the same kind of ropey root. So if they have roots like this, yes, the gophers are going to be attracted to it. And they not only love the, the roots, they love the center core of the agave because it's very, very juicy, the core of an agave. And I'll show you then that in the next slide. So this was a very big agave, probably four to five feet wide. And one gopher decided to eat up into the core of this agave and it just killed it. This is dirt right here in the core of the agave, by the way. So there's another plant. If you have an expensive agave, this might be worth caging. Besides the formium, this is another one that I would probably advise that you cage, but use a tree size cage. Get something that's, that's going to be big enough for a full grown plant. So 15 gallon size would probably be big enough for a big agave like this. Don't go small because it's not gonna do much protecting. All right, um, here's the other gopher favorites. Here's a formium again. Um, this is a gazania, and this is a malo plant. Rock purslane, they also, that's another one. Uh, rock purslane is a um, succulent, and they will tend to eat the stems as they, as it grows, the stems grow on top of the surface, and they're very juicy, and the gophers find them, and they can all, they can nibble on the stems of the rock purslane, but they don't really like the roots that much because they're very small. Poppies, yarrow, and roses are other favorites. So natural predators, um, you can adopt a feral cat, but um, there are certain requirements. And I can't remember all the requirements, but um, you, you have to go through a whole questionnaire to see if you're eligible to adopt a feral cat. Of course, they have to be neutered. Um, these are two sites you can approach, uh, whisper.org and Nine Lives Foundation. And uh, I recommend a feral cat because um, domestic cats don't know what a gopher is. They'll sit there and look at the hole, look at the little animal, and they'll just kind of say, oh, that's interesting. But I've seen it happen where a cat is just watching a gopher 
come out of the hole and it's doing nothing. So you need a natural wild instinct as a feral cat has. And um, be a bit cautious though, cats also kill birds. So that's another caution to keep in mind. You can put up a bar, a barn owl nest, but I think that's only really advantageous for large acreage areas. And they don't necessarily hunt right near where their nest is anyway. So, uh, but they do get a lot of gophers, a hundred, over a hundred per month in, in wide open spaces. Um, dogs will hunt gophers. I had a terrier once that was very good at digging very deep holes and not catching very many gophers. So they do more damage than a gopher. Other predators, bobcats, mountain lions, of course, weasels, blue herons, foxes, hawks, coyotes, gopher snakes. The reason I had all those gopher mounds in my six acres of Pescadero was because I put up a deer fence that kept out the coyotes, kept out most of the bobcats, kept out most of the predators. And that's why I had, was overrun with, go with gophers because I put up that deer fence. So keep that in mind. Um, yeah, and, and be sure you bury or discard gopher carcasses because if you toss them out in the field and you're gonna have those ravens caw, caw, cawing over your head constantly, which is really a nuisance. So be sure you, you discard your, um, your carcasses appropriately. Here's some non-tested solutions that you'll see on the internet or your friends might tell you about. And I have only used one of these and that's a sonic device. And this was decades ago when I first tried the first one. And I put it out and the next day there was a gopher mound right next to it. And I took a picture of the gopher mound and the trap and I returned the, I mean, and the sonic device. And then I returned the sonic device to the manufacturer because obviously it didn't work. And what I'm reading online is that the research done on these is not is proving not to be very effective uh, in most cases. And some people swear by them. And I think maybe initially they might be deterred, uh, repelled by the noise or this vibration, but I think eventually they get used to it. So I haven't really seen it being very effective in my experience anyway. And all these other ones, I have another master gardener friend who swears by instant potatoes. She just puts that in the hole and she says that works. And But no, re no research done on that either. So if you want to do a research study, let me know. Um, there's more radical methods. If you have big acreage, you can just use this blasting rotinator thing that, you know, you it's like a flamethrower, underground flamethrower in it. And things like starts exploding in the in the distance, and uh, it yeah it does a good it's a, it's very effective, but it also can cause fires. It's not recommended for home gardeners. Um, the giant destroyer it's a gas that is usually not that effective because gophers can usually plug holes and and avoid the gas. Um, you can, you know, people tell me, oh, I'll just put a hose down and, and the gopher comes out. Well, yeah, that can happen. A gopher could, you could actually get a gopher to run out of the hole with, with a hose. Not every time, but um, it could happen. But then you have to deal with catching the gopher after it runs out of the hole. And flooding definitely gets rid of gophers. Every time we had a flood in Pescadero, we didn't have a gopher issue for many years after that. So but but putting it down the hole is not that effective. Shovels and pitchforks, on the other hand, work very well, especially if they little they stick up their little head right in front of you and you have a shovel in your hand. Um, guns, uh, yes, you could use a shotgun if you lived in Pescadero like my neighbor did, but um, it's illegal in most parts of our county. So I don't recommend guns. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about moles. And I want to, if I, if, if I had an audience here, I'd ask you, what's wrong with this picture? And um, the answer is moles do not appear above ground. This is a dead mole that someone posed above ground so that you could see its little face. But you're never going to see this in the garden as far as I've, I've ever experienced. Here, um, a mole will just come up, as I said before, and, and push the dirt up and then, then the dirt falls down like a volcano. So that's how you tell it's a mole. And then of course, I already described their tunnels. Um, also, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. You've heard of that expression before, right? 
So when you do see damage, like my son calls me over the other day, mom, you got to come over and get this gopher. It's messing up my lawn. And I go over and I go, oh, it's a mole. And I said, I'm, you know, it's a lot harder to catch a mole with, with any kind of trap than it is than a gopher. So I just said, well, this is what you do. You take your boot and you just swipe it across the top of that and shove the soil around so that it's not blocking the light to your grass and killing your grass. And I said, this is the easiest way to remedy that. Just kick the soil away. And then you don't have to look at the soil anymore and the grass will grow back. It's not really killed. It's just uprooted a little bit. So um, that's what I recommend in most cases. But if you want to trap them, I've got some references in the next slides for that. And look what this mole did over here across from me in the park. Like, aren't they little ingenious little critters, how they can squeeze between a half, half inch of space to get their soil out like that. And this is also mole damage. They were they went along this edging here and then this and then the storm came along and they and this this just kind of um, fell in the dirt fell in the the tunnel system so that that's old mole tunnel damage. Here is a uh, mold tunnel damage underneath what we had. We had a tent up for a long time. And that's what they you know, do. They find moist spaces and they can actually undermine foundations and, and stone hardscape. So that's the damage that moles can do besides just making a pile on your lawn. They do serve a purpose, by the way. They do help aerate the soil. So they, they do have a purpose in nature. Um, these, these are other mold traps you can use, but you can use cinch traps, but you have to go both directions because you don't know which direction the mold is going to tr be traveling from. And you always have to cover that hole with something like um, dirt or a piece of wood or some or pot or something. So because they're not going to come back to this location if they see daylight, they're repelled by light. Uh, these are some other traps Thomas Whitman will demonstrate on and how to use. Uh, I think he uses this Victor plunger. I, I've never been successfully using it, though. I, I think I need to practice a lot more, and I just don't bother. Here's how you can block the light with a piece of plywood, for instance. And this, you, this is the trap, again, you might use for moles. I think it might be more effective for moles because then you can get the mole going either direction in the, in the hole. And then there's other mole trapping technique, techniques that Thomas Whit Whitman has on his website, and those are the links, so you can watch those at your leisure. And then, um, so repellents and attractants. So people swear by these repellents, and I'm not saying they don't work. They, they probably do work for moles because moles are repelled by odors, certain odors, castor oil, for instance. Um, will repel a mole and you just have to keep reapplying it after it rains. So just keep that in mind. Or if you hate your neighbor, you know, use it all the time and then they'll go over to your neighbor's house, right? Instead of staying, sticking around with your, your place. But uh, it's something that's temporary. So repellents are temporary. Um, they, um, they might be repelled by gopher spurge. It's a euphorbia where not, it's not been tested. Castor bean has not been tested, but those two things may repel them. Um, other repellents, Ropel and castor oil, coyote, human or cat urine. Now, I don't want all these men that watching this to, to feel like this is now their new outdoor space because that's not nice. Um, but actually, it's they say it does help. Um, any type of, of animal urine might repel them. Um, fish emulsion is very stinky and, and would repel them and, or meat products around perennials until it rains again, of course. So here's the references that you can look at uh, after, you know, when you get these slides. And um, I want to thank um, Lingso Garden Materials for hosting and supporting our presentations. They're a great help in getting the word across to all these home gardeners. And um, I think that's it. This is uh, where you can subscribe to our newsletter. If you want to donate, then feel free to do that. We always will take your money. And um, 
Here's our hours at certain locations, San Francisco Botanical Garden, 10.30 to 1.30 on Tuesdays and Thursdays at Veterans Memorial Senior Center. And it's no longer at Elkis because of the bridge washed out. And I think that might, and oh, well, we're not gonna do rats. That's another class. <laughs> okay. So now we're all set for questions, I think. All right, awesome. So let's, um, I'm gonna just go in order uh, from the beginning of the presentation, uh, Janice, and then we'll just kind of go towards the end. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see here. Um, this is regarding a master gardener uh, connection. Uh, there are folks that are not necessarily from the Bay Area. There are other master gardeners from throughout the state. Uh, is there a link on how other master gardeners can be in touch with other county master gardeners? Uh, do you know anything about that? Um, all you have to do is Google the county and master gardeners and you're going to come up with their website and then they're going to have communication and contact links within their, within their website. So they're pretty easy to get a hold of from, from the public standpoint or from master gardener standpoint. They're really easy to find. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, mm -hmm. I know we didn't really talk much about ground squirrels. Would some of your techniques be used for ground squirrels as well? The traps for ground squirrels are much larger. And um, I think you can, I think most people might actually use live traps for, for ground squirrels, but I don't have any experience with them because they're not in our county yet, or they're very close to being in our county, but not quite here as far as I've, as far as I've experienced. So um, I'd have to refresh my memory as to, I know there's, there's really big traps you can use for these, for these gopher ground squirrels, but yeah, I, I do a presentation on that. So I'm sure that we'll be doing one in the near future and you can watch that and I'll update myself on what's new there. All righty. Um, and then I know you have a presentation on rats as well. Uh, this question is uh, in particular related to kangaroo rats or desert rats. Um, you know, they have underground tunnels as well. And this person's wondering if they're in the gopher family. I probably not. Yeah, I never experienced a kangaroo rat. We don't have them around here. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, don't, I wish I knew, but I don't. <laughs> okay. Um, so gophers do leave open holes. Um, this person has holes, not mounds in their garden beds. Um, so are they dealing with rats in their garden beds rather than gophers, you think? Um, Gophers can leave open holes when they're excavating, but also with all the rain we've been having, I've noticed some holes opening up in my parking lot. You know, some some really shallow tunnel systems or holes that were once plugged up. With all this excess rain we've been getting, it opens up those old uh, burrows and holes. And so that just may be an old hole. Although, you know, voles will occupy a, a hole made by another animal. Voles are another little critter, like a little meadow mouse they look they look small little things that can uh travel along pathways and climb up your plant and e they eat from the bottom up so that's how you know if you've got a vole if you're if your plant is eaten at the top it's more likely like a deer for instance but if your plant is eaten from the bottom then it's probably a vole and they do occupy unoccupied um burrows and tunnels that were made by gophers and moles yeah. Um, the um, let me see. Let me move on to a question that's repeated here, but I'm going to paraphrase. How often um, after trapping can gophers return to the same areas? And is this an, sort of an ongoing uh, maintenance or can you do it? Yeah, it, it, it can happen within within minutes or, or hours or days depending on how many you have in your area, like I was next to open space. So they were constantly coming in. Right. But I did manage to nip them in the bud by getting 400 gophers that that solved my problem. And then I trained the person who bought my, my uh, property on how to do it. And he's been keeping them under control. <laughs> so it's not as big a problem for him, 
But let me tell you, the home gardener is probably only going to have one or two. In, in Half Moon Bay, I would say the max I've ever had here is like three a year. And in over in the other side of the hill, in the what I call the city areas, um, they rarely see gophers anymore. So they've eradicated a lot of the gophers in the more urban areas. But over here in Half Moon Bay, we see typically maybe three to five gophers in the in uh, a, you know five thousand square foot property. It's not that many. Okay. And then um, regarding the video that you had shown where, um, you know, you trap a gopher and then you're then to just put it back right, you know, where the hole was to, for uh -huh. it to compose. Um, what are some of the other ways to get rid of them if a person does not want the gophers going back into the hole to decompose? Uh, you can put it in your regular trash can. Don't put it in your green bin. Put it in your regular trash can. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Um, let's see. Go down. I don't know why you can't put it in a green bin, but I heard somewhere at one point in time, because you can put food scraps in green bins now. So I'm not sure why you're not supposed to put a gopher in there, but I read somewhere you're not. No. Interesting. And yeah. um, can you f leave them out for the birds to eat, like say owls or hawks or turkey vultures even? Um, hawks don't eat dead animals, but turkey vultures would. If you really want to attract and ravens and crows would. Um, I think I think they both do. I know one is more of a scavenger than the other, maybe. But but you don't really want those little those animals circling overhead every time you go out to to trap or pull out a gopher because I, I I had a partner once who had this you know bald very recognizable bald head and he was too his back hurt so he couldn't bury those gophers in the hole when he trapped after he pulled them out of there he just tossed them out in the field well pretty soon those ravens knew. He, he was what he was doing when he walked out into the field and they start circling and cawing and cawing and making a racket. And, you know, I don't really think you want that just to be honest with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, the, uh, a couple of the questions asked about accidental triggering of the cinch traps or any other traps that you had mentioned can, uh, pets, uh, like dogs or cats, uh, triggers uh, these traps? Um, I suppose it's possible if they bumped into them, but they don't, um, or if, you know, I, I had two dogs in my acreage for years, not one came in with a bloody nose the whole time. They, they might be attracted to a, a wiggling a wiggling of a trap. If there was a gopher still alive and was and started to wiggle the trap, they might be attracted to that, but that's not a danger after it's triggered. Uh, so no, I've never really experienced any harm with using the cinch traps and those gophinator traps, boy, they're, they're vicious. So, so you want to be careful with those, uh, but then they're way down in the tunnel and the and uh, a dog is not typically going to dig down there after a gopher trap. Yeah. Um, and I know we talked a lot about traps today. Uh, folks are wondering if there are resources to get rid of the gophers without killing them and possibly, you know, coexisting. Um, you know, I know you had mentioned some um, plans and things to repel them. Um, yeah. But are they well, the only yeah, the only thing you can do is to cage um, or repel, re repel or cage because you can't live trap them. It's illegal to catch and release them. So that's that's not part of the scenario, you know, the yeah. solution. Yeah, it's not part of the solution. Yeah. Yeah. Because. OK. Um All right. So this person puts the Anothis, uh Greases in gopher cages um, and their Meyer lemon. Was that not a good idea? Uh, yeah, I don't think it's it's a good idea to 
Yeah, both of those are going to have a woody plant that's going to have woody roots. I haven't really looked at ceanothus roots to tell you how they, how woody they are, but they, they get huge. Usually they get pretty huge. So I would probably advise against that. And lemon tree, yeah, definitely I would not, not go for cage a lemon tree. I would maybe put a temporary, you know, aviary wire cage around it for a couple of years to get it established. And uh, hopefully they don't target your tree because it's the moistest thing in the garden. I know you have to water lemons more often than other plants. Uh, you know, most people will plant drought tolerant plants in their garden, but lemons need more water. So they're the, they're the most moist thing in the garden and that does attract gophers. So I know that they can kill a lemon tree. I've heard it happen before, but hopefully there are other things in the garden they could go after instead of your lemon tree. What if if um, you're planting bare root, root fruit, fruit tree in sort of like a soft steel cages? Um, should they be replanted? Oh, those stainless steel little flexible things I showed you. Yeah, do uh -huh. not plant any trees in those little stainless steel cages with the tiny holes. Oh, yeah, you're going to kill your tree. Yeah, mm -hmm. not not a good idea. Any and any tree for that matter. And I'll let me say this again. I don't recommend you cage any tree unless you want to protect a young tree for a couple of years. And then you can use aviary wire, half inch aviary wire, make your own cage, make it big, three feet wide at least, and then it'll rust out in a couple of years. But that's the only kind of cage I would use for trees. Um, I know you had mentioned moles don't, uh, they're not active during the day. Um, um, I guess uh, this person's neighborhood has lots of moles um, and they even saw one crossing the street during the day. Is that sort of normal? Um, I've never seen a mole outside its, its hole. I've never seen one. Are they, maybe they're thinking gophers? Um, maybe, or maybe, maybe the young are dispersed like gophers are dispersed and maybe they actually have to travel uh, above ground, but I'm assuming it would only happen in the middle of the night in the dark, because that's the only time I could see a mole being out of its um, burrow. And I did one night uh, at midnight, I would have to walk my dog for an emergency purpose. And I followed a gopher down Main Street here in Half Moon Bay that was finding, trying to find a home. That's the only time in the, other than in the a garden that I was planting that I've, that I've seen one traveling along, along the road anywhere. Okay. Uh, what about bowls? Bowls, they're above ground little critters. Yeah. They're tiny little meadow mice and yeah, they'll, they, they're less active in the middle of the day because of predators, but um, yeah, that, that's, you got to use mouse traps on them, probably make little tunnels where they you find their their little trails, put a little tunnel over it so they have to go through the tunnel and put a couple of mouse traps back to back in there and probably that's the best way to deal with voles. Okay. Um, does crepe myrtles repel gophers? Never heard of that. I don't know. Okay. Um, or I guess the question was, do gophers like crepe metal, uh, myrtles? And if yes. oh. <laughs> well, they, yeah, they'll probably eat the, the roots of any young tree when they're, when they're young, the older the root, the tougher the root and the less water they're in nutrient value they're going to get from the root. Oh, so yeah. it's the more, it's the younger roots that they're going to go after. And can you plant enough plants that they don't like around it to repel them? You can always try that. You know, go for, go back to the list that I provided here from those two sources and plant a bunch of those plants around them and see what see if it works for you. I don't think there's been enough research done on the subject to actually say this is definitely a gopher resistant plant and this one isn't. And it's 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 tough sometimes to predict. Uh, do you have any suggestions or resources on how to eradicate rabbits? Um, yeah, I, that's part of another presentation. And um, yeah, it, I don't, it's kind of like lengthy to get into, but 
if you want me to do another presentation on rabbits and deer and squirrels and rats, then I can do that. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's do that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think you've done uh, that before. <laughs> I've done that. Yes. Yeah. I've done that. Okay. Um, all right. So let's end with the last question here. Um, where did it go? Okay. Can you help with questions from um, outside the Bay Area if they were to call? Um, you know, can anyone call the Master Gardener hotline, even if they're not in the San Mateo, San Francisco County? For example, you know, can somebody from LA call the hotline and ask questions? I suppose they could, but they could call their own county Master Gardener program and get more relevant answers especially because they're, you know, plant, if they're talking about plants, I mean, gophers are gophers probably in the same, they're treated the same in Northern California or Southern California, but plants and climates and microclimates are all different. So I would recommend you always contact your local master gardener program from your county. Okay. Awesome. And that was the last of the um, question. Oh, well, one more follow-up to that question. How do you find the the Master Gardener program in each counties and cities. I know you've said just Google the yes. city and then Master Gardener right next to it. And they should know the county. Google the county and Master Gardener with it. And then that will bring up the site for the your county Master Gardener program. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that was it. That was the end of the talk. Anything else that you'd like to share with uh, the audience here today, Janice? Um, maybe you could share the date of my next presentation on succulents. Um, I don't yes. have that hint. Yeah. It's up on our website right now on Linkso. It's also on Eventbrite. It, it will be um, around same time, 1 to 3, Wednesday, April 12th. And it's all about succulents. Yeah. So okay. join in. Join yeah. me again. Okay. okay. We'll see you next month. Thank you so much, Janice. And I'll all see right. you again. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone.